Hello chemists, this is Ms. Placino and you are watching Screencast 6.4 on ideal stoichiometric calculations. Uh, today we're going to be talking about, well, what stoichiometry is and how we apply it to chemical equations. Uh, basically you can think of stoichiometry as being the math behind a chemical equation. And we're going to use a balanced chemical equation to help us perform more intricate mole conversions. Uh, don't get overwhelmed, it's really not so bad. You actually perform kind of stoichiometry all the time if you're somebody who follows any recipes. Uh, so let's take a look at the do now. You are baking cookies and the recipe calls for two cups of sugar. If you want to cut the recipe in half, how much sugar is needed? What if you triple the recipe? Explain. All right. Um, so we take a look at this. Let's start with this first question. If you want to cut the recipe in half, well, if you want to cut the whole recipe in half and you want to make half as many cookies, uh, you've got to cut the amount of sugar in half. So if it calls for two cups, then, well, if we want to cut it in half, we only need one. In addition, we'd have to cut all of the other ingredients in half as well. It wouldn't make any sense to leave uh, the number of eggs and the amount of flour used as exactly the same if we're cutting the recipe in half. If we want to triple the recipe, well, we'd have to triple the amount of sugar. It calls for two cups and we want to triple it. Two times three gives me six. You'd need six cups of sugar. Uh, you have to keep the ratio of ingredients constant. Otherwise, you are not going to make what you want. Uh, your cookies are going to turn out all weird. And really, the same exact principles apply to stoichiometry. Of course, we're not going to be talking about making cookies. We're going to be looking at chemical equations. But it's the same general idea. It's about keeping that ratio constant even as um, like the amount of product that you need to produce changes. So here's another analogy for it. Let's say that you are building tricycles and we'll really simplify it down. Um, you need three wheels, you need one seat, you need two pedals, and from there you can make one tricycle. So we've got this first example where everything balances out. If we've got nine wheels, and we would need three seats, six pedals, that way we could make three tricycles. Uh, let's say that you have four bike seats. How many of each of those uh, other um, components would you need to make a tricycle? Well, hopefully you know uh, if it's in a three to one ratio, I've quadrupled the number of seats that I have, so I'd have to quadruple all of the coefficients. Go through and underline them. So 3 times 4 is 12. Uh, I would need a total of 8 pedals, and that would allow me to make 4 tricycles. Now we can look at it from a different perspective, or start at a different place, I should say. Let's say you only want to make 2 tricycles. Well, then we have to double all the coefficients. I need 6 wheels, I need 2 bicycle seats, and I need 4 pedals. Hopefully you can kind of see where we're going with this. If you have 18 pedals, that means that you are going to uh, need 27 wheels, 9 bike seats, so that you can make 9 tricycles. And finally, if you start off with 30 wheels, you would need 10 seats, 20 pedals, and that would enable you to make 10 tricycles. Even as we change the number of, well, I don't really want to call them ingredients, but components, the ratios stay the same. It's always that 3 to 1 to 2 to 1 ratio, regardless of whether we're scaling up or scaling down. So let's talk a little bit about applying that to chemistry, and we'll use mole-to-mole -mole conversions. So you've got this chemical equation. It is a synthesis reaction between sulfur and oxygen to form sulfur trioxide. First thing you want to do is get it balanced. There we go. A lot of people, when they first start learning about chemical equations, assume that the coefficients are talking about molecules. You have one molecule of S8 reacting with 12 molecules of O2, and you are producing eight molecules of sulfur trioxide. Well, that vision isn't entirely incorrect. It's not the most accurate. We're talking about ratio of moles. We're talking about a mole of S8 reacting with 12 moles of O2 to produce 8 moles of sulfur trioxide. And as we vary the amount of any of these uh, substances, whether it's a reactant or a product, um, we need to make sure that that ratio of 1 to 12 to 8 stays the same. Let's try an easy one. Let's say that you want to make 24 moles of sulfur trioxide. How many moles of S8 are needed? Well, if you think about this, um, I need 24 moles. I know the way this is set up. I'm going to make 8 moles of sulfur trioxide. So I don't even really need to set up any stoichiometry, but I'm going to do it just to show you how it works. I have 24 moles of SO3 needed. I'm interested in S8. Well, I know for every 8 moles of SO3, um, I can produce one mole, or I should say I used one mole of S8. 
moles of SO3 cancel out. And I would come up with a 24 divided by 8. So 3 moles of S8. And that's probably something you can do in your head. Uh, but this is the general technique or setup that you're going to want to use. Let's say you use 6 moles of O2. How many moles of SO3 can you produce? If we go back to the chemical equation, um, we're in a 1 to 12 to 8 ratio. I've cut my number of moles of O2 in half. So I'm probably going to have to do the same with the amount of sulfur trioxide that could be produced. So in this case, I could only make 4 moles of SO3. Here's where we finally get into a situation where it's almost essential that you go ahead and you set up uh, what we call a mole ratio. Let me just get situated so I can do this. I've got 2.78 moles of S8. I want to know how many moles of O2 are needed. I go back to the balanced chemical equation. I know that 12 moles of O2 are required to react with 1 mole of S8. My mole of S8 to cancel out. Let's cross the whole thing out. That's going to leave me with moles of O2. And in this case, I get 33.4 mole of oxygen gas is required. Um, so it's kind of the same thing that we've been talking about in previous lessons. We're talking about um, dimensional analysis and conversion in between units. The only catch is we are using a balanced chemical equation to help us convert. That's it. Otherwise, it's the same exact process. Let's talk about the most complicated stoichiometric conversion I can ask you to do. Um, you can do what's called a gram to gram conversion. Let's say I've got 14.8 grams of S8 reacting with O2, and we'll assume that's in excess, meaning there's plenty of oxygen around to ensure that all of the sulfur is converted into our final product, sulfur trioxide. The question is asking how many grams of sulfur trioxide will be produced? I've got a whole bunch of conversions to do. Um, we're starting off with grams of S8, and ultimately we want to get into grams of SO3. Now we can't really compare grams to grams because S8 and SO3 have very different molar masses, so it's not fair to compare them by weight. Um, instead of using grams, a better unit to use would be moles. So the first thing I need to do is get out of grams of S8 and convert into moles of S8. How could I do that? Uh, hopefully you're thinking, well, you can do that by finding the molar mass of S8. Find the mass of sulfur, multiply it by 8, and that will tell you how many grams one mole of S8 will weigh. From there, I can take moles of S8, and I can convert into moles of SO3. How am I going to be able to do that? Use the balanced chemical equation. I know for every one mole of S8 that is used, I can produce eight moles of sulfur trioxide, SO3. So I can convert using the balanced chemical equation. Last step is getting back to grams of SO3. Uh, that's very similar to the first conversion we made. In order to get from moles to grams, we need to use the molar mass. So you'd have to look up the molar mass or I should say determine the molar mass of SO3 by adding the mass of mole of sulfur plus three moles of oxygen, and then use that as a conversion factor to get you into grams. So they showed up here in your textbook, um, and these are really as complicated as I can make them for you. I give you a mass of a given substance in grams. You've got to convert into moles using, they call it the molar mass factor, but basically just using molar mass. This is the part that everybody forgets about. Going back to the balanced chemical equation, this is the only connection you have between moles of S8 and moles of SO3, so it's extremely important. And finally, once you've got moles of your unknown, you can use the molar mass of that substance to convert back into grams. So let's try this out and see how we do. And 14.8 grams of S8, we want to know how many grams of SO3 will be produced. So let's start off by writing down what we know. And I'm going to be really specific, and I would recommend that you do the same, is you really want to keep track of units and even more specifically what substance you're talking about. I know that a mole of S8 has a molar mass of 256 grams. I can get rid of grams of S8. I'm now in moles of S8. 
I need to get to grams of SO3. And before I can do that, moles of SO3. So I need to go back to the balanced chemical equation. I can see that for every one mole of S8, eight moles of SO3 can be produced. That gets me out of moles of S8 and into moles of SO3. The molar mass of sulfur trioxide is 80 grams. So I can use that conversion factor. That cancels out my moles of SO3 and leaves me in grams of SO3. And that works out to be roughly 37 grams of SO3. Uh, just like with other unit conversions or dimensional analysis problems that we've talked about so far, you really want to work step by step. Take the number that you've been given along with its units and work stepwise to get to the units that you need. Um, and when we're talking about any sort of stoichiometrical problem, you're going to have to go back to the balanced chemical equation at one point or another and use the ratio of moles to help you out. Let's do another practice problem. I think it's uh, question five in your workbook. I've got a single replacement reaction between boron mononitride and fluorine to produce boron trifluoride and nitrogen gas. So the first thing I need to do is get this equation balanced. So I'll start with fluorines, put a three there. That'll give me six fluorines. I got six fluorines on the product side. I've got two borons on the, product, uh, the reactant side and the product side and one N2. All right, I'm balanced. Um, I'm told that I'm starting with 4.91 grams of boron mononitride, and I'm interested in trying to figure out how many moles of BF3 I can produce and how many liters of N2 can be produced. So I'm going to start with 4.91 grams of boron mononitride. I'm going to try to convert that into moles. So I need to find the molar mass of BN. And it turns out that one mole of BN has a molar mass of about 24.8 grams. And again, I'm going to be very specific about what substance I'm talking about. Grams of BM, uh, BN cancel. Um, all right, I'm looking for moles of BF3. The only connection I have between boron mononitride and boron trifluoride is through the balanced chemical equation. I can see that for every two moles of BF3 that are produced, it required two moles of boron mononitride. Now I understand from a mathematical perspective, multiplying by two and then dividing by two doesn't really accomplish anything. But from a unit perspective, I need this last conversion factor, put a box around it, uh, because that allows me to stop talking about moles of boron mononitride and start talking about moles of boron trifluoride. And you can see this is the unit that it is asking for, so I'm done. And now I just have to use my calculator. I've got 4.91 times 2 divided by 24.8 times 2. Um, and again, you can just kind of ignore the multiply and divide by 2, because mathematically it makes no difference. And I come up with 0 0.198 moles of boron trifluoride. Let's try the second part of this question. It's going to start off the same way. You've got 4.91 grams of BN. You know that you're going to need to get two moles of BN. That's going to be accomplished by using the molar mass of boron mononitride. I'm out of grams. I'm into moles. Up next, I need to convert into moles of my product. In this case, I'm looking at N2. So for every one mole of N2, Using the chemical equation, I can see that it required two moles of BN. And finally, the unit that we want is liters. So I know that one mole of N2 is going to take on a volume, and we'll just make the assumption we're operating at standard temperature and pressure, of 22.4 liters. Moles of N2 cancel. And I am left with liters of N2. So I can take 4.91 times 22.4 and then divide that by 22, uh, sorry, 24.8 times 2. And I'll end up with 2.22 liters of N2. All right. Uh, so that's really how this process works. Usually you're going to be given a quantity 
Oftentimes it's not going to be in moles, which is the units you need. Uh, you're going to have to convert. If it's given to you in grams, that means you use the molar mass to convert. If it's given to you in number of atoms, you use Avogadro's number. If it's given to you in liters, you can use molar volume. From there, you can use the balanced chemical equation to figure out what is the ratio between the two substances that you're talking about. Usually you're gonna be looking at reactants and products. Once you've got the mole of the substance you're looking for, check and see what unit is needed. So in the first example, you could just leave it in the mole. Um, in our second part of the same problem, we needed to convert that into liters. So we're gonna go back to one of the unit conversions we learned in the previous lesson to get out of moles and into the desired unit. Uh, just like last time, you've got a bunch of different practice problems to play around with. I highly recommend trying them out and getting more comfortable with these, uh, this, this whole process. All right, thanks for tuning in, and I hope you found this helpful.